It's okay, we didn't miss anything other than what we were going to do. Uh, so let's look at, if you have with you the, the handouts, I don't have, I have a couple extra handouts maybe, uh, but I'm going to put them up here, and your blank sheet of paper is for us to go through uh, these exercises, uh, and I'm just going to put them up on the, uh, the board like this, and I'll make them as big as we can. And you may have this in the handout. Uh, everybody probably didn't pick up the handout or remember to bring them here, uh, so that's okay. Uh, we'll go through, and the handout, by the way, has been uploaded to uh, Canvas, so uh, we may still have some, some actions with Canvas, but we'll, we're going to look at exercise one, exercise two, and we're going to answer the questions. So we are looking at precedence diagramming. That means the stuff that needs to follow uh, other tasks. And so we got a few exercises, two of them that we're going to do in this handout. When presented with the critical path, float, or ESLS, EFLF question, we're going to solve it by. Let's go back. What is the critical path? It's the longest path through the sequence. And, and so that is the critical path. That's the one, if one of those tasks goes late, the whole project becomes late. And that's, that's something we've got to know and keep our thumb on. What is the critical path? What is float? That's slack. No, slack. Another word for that is slack. Float and slack are the same thing. And that's where you have, you have room. You have wiggle room. A task should start by this date. Maybe it can't start before this date. But if it doesn't start on this date, it could still start next week and get done on time. Uh, and, and so it's not going to push the whole project uh, to, to the late status. That's what float is. ESLS, what are those two things? Early start. Early start. The earliest start and the latest start to make the timeline that we're projecting from the critical path. EF and LF. Earliest finish and the latest finish. So those are the answers that we need to have task by task as we go through the task. We uh, go through the planning process. We don't have to note them the way they tell us to note them. They're, that's just a notation. And so if you, whatever scribbles you like to put uh, around, you can develop your own system. It's a good idea to understand the typical system that's used, uh, but it's, there's no magic about the specific uh, that, that we'll show you. So the task that we're going to do is we're going to create the project precedent diagram. We are going to determine the critical path. We're going to calculate the activities float. We're going to go through a forward pass and uh, determine the early starts and early finishes. And we are then going to do a backwards pass and determine the late starts and the late finishes. That is what we've done now several times together. We're just going to do it one more time here. This is not, not news. This is just going slow, so we keep everybody on the same page. We are given the following activities, and then we are given five questions. And we won't know the answers to these questions until we map it out. So we're going to map it together, and, and we're going to do it. Now, this one has... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It has eight tasks or activities. And for each of those activities, it shows what has to happen before that activity. And it shows what the duration is. So like maybe B is pour concrete, but you can't pour the concrete until you've done the frame, the, you know, you've, you've done the forms. You've set the forms and and, 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 and provided with the base for your concrete. So that's a, that's a predecessor activity that has to be done before you can deliver concrete and pour concrete. So that would be an example. The duration is in units, and these are units that you make up. The only thing that you should know is 
all of those duration units should be the same unit. So don't talk minutes in one for one task, hours for another task, and days for another task. That will throw off your map. So use the same units for duration, uh, and there's not a rule on how to set those units. It, you know, it, part of a day, you know, it kind of depends on the task. You know, there's some things that, that happen very, very quickly, and talking minutes and seconds is appropriate. Other, other tasks uh, take weeks, and maybe the units are weeks. You know, if you're building a high-rise building, you know, put the windows in, that may take five weeks, you know, for one task, you know. So, so make sure the durations are all in the same units, and that those units somewhere are understood by everybody that's going to look at it. So we're going to answer the questions what is a critical path? And just looking at this duration chart, this table, we could call that a task list or a to-do list. It's not readily apparent what the critical path is from that. Now, you could maybe apply yourself, and it's a fairly simple example, so maybe, maybe you could figure it out uh, in a little bit of how to do it just by looking at that table. <coughs> but what project management is about is about us drawing a picture so that people don't have to decipher it. Just like in Lean Six Sigma and in statistics, we're using graphing and, and tables to draw a picture. So we want to take the numbers, in this case numbers and letters, and we want to take those numbers and letters and paint a picture that anybody can tell by looking uh, more information than they can by trying to decipher the table. So the other questions we're going to answer is, what is the early start of activity D? And I look at activity D and the predecessor is activity C and H, but I don't know what the, when that start is until I map it out. What's the late start of activity F? So whoever's doing activity F calls me up and said, hey, all our guys got COVID, they're not gonna be on a job site on Monday. Oh crap, what'd that do to our, our project plan? Uh, I don't know right now because I don't know what the late start is of activity F. Do I have float in activity F? Or, or are they pushing the whole project late because they've got guys with COVID? Uh, and so, so if I are, if I know that I've got, it's a seven week duration and I've got three weeks of flow, I'm not quite as alarmed. I'm hoping that, that their guys will be back to work or we can find substitute guys during that period of time to make up so that activity F doesn't finish late. What's the early finish for activity B? What's the late finish for activity E? We will answer all five of those questions in a little bit. Uh, right now, uh, we're not gonna do exercise two, we're gonna go to exercise one, answers. This is, if you have the handout, it's the third page of the, of the handout. It says, uh, sentence one, Josie, tell us what we're supposed to do. Right here. Just read it off the slide. Begin by drawing the activities on, on the PDF diagram based on the activities, predecessors, and duration of the table. Okay, so we're, we're drawing an activity on node. We talked about that last class. Uh, we said there's two kinds of activity on uh, notations. One is activity on node. And the other was activity on what? Arrow. Arrow. So the activity is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I don't know what those activities are. They're just a letter right now. But I put the activity, it's telling us on the node. So that means the arrows are connecting the nodes. So that each node is an activity. Just to remind our brain, an activity on arrow is showing the letter, the activity, on an arrow, and the length of that arrow should be to scale, the scale of the duration. So arrow that has activity A on it should be three times as long as the arrow that has activity B on it. And the nodes that they point to are just milestone events that say, hey, we finished activity A. So the activity is on an arrow, and the arrow is proportionate to the length of the activity. 
a little bit more complex, but we did talk about that. Most of the people are going to get more information more quickly from the activity on node, which is what we're doing here. Activity on node. So Josie told us we need to draw the diagram based on the activities, the predecessors, and the durations that are in the table. Where do we begin? Mitch. Uh, start node. Begin with the start node, and then what? So yeah, so reading that sentence, it says, begin with the start node and then add the activities having start as their precedent, predecessor. In this case, A is the only one. So put the paper probably sideways just for convenience. Uh, landscape mode will draw. And on the left-hand side of that, we're going to put a start. Now this has the answers. So see what we got there. We've got the start box. This is a node and the arrows are just connecting the nodes. They are not in length by how long the duration is, and the size of the box or the node has nothing to do with how long the duration is. These are just a collection of boxes that are depicting an activity, and the activity is labeled in the box. I started with the activity on the far left, which is the start button, the precedent uh, of start is nothing, so I got nothing to the left of start. To the right of start, I go to the predecessor column and I find start, and I see that A is the activity that is a predecessor of start. So we draw a box, and I want you to draw the box on your paper, please. And then we go from A to, we look for in the middle column, the predecessors that are A. And I have three of them. I have B, uh, A is a predecessor to B, A is a predecessor to E, and A is a predecessor to G. So they have drawn those three boxes, one on top of the other, which is fine. You can draw it however your creative form of art wants to draw. You just have to connect the arrows correctly. So it, it doesn't matter if you have the G and H on top and the E and F on the bottom. So that's correct. It does not matter. As long as the arrows are connecting them in the right sequence. Yeah. Uh, this is not the only way to draw it. This is their way of drawing it. Uh, and, and you might choose a different way of drawing it. As long as the arrows are connecting, as long as there's an arrow connecting the A box to the E box, for one of them, that's fine. That E box could be off here in right field if you wanted it to be. Not, there's not a rule on that. But there is a rule that the arrow connecting A and E needs to be pointing from A to E. Now, we have A also pointing to B and A also pointing to G. And we got that just by looking at the predecessor column and seeing what was in front of it. So in front of it, activity that precedes uh, D uh, is to the right or to the left. The activity that precedes a letter over here is to the right or to the left? To the left. To the left. This column is to the left of these activities. Okay? Uh, now we add the activities based on their predecessor. E, B, and G have activity, A is a precedent, so add them next. Continue until we reach the end, and then after we've got them connected in order from the table, we now go back and we drop in the durations in each of the boxes, and that's from the third column there. So you can just copy this, but I'd rather you put your brain through the table and look at the table and say, okay, um, D has two things that need to be to the left of it, C and H. And the N has two things that need to be to the left of it, D and F. And so you start drawing and you may wind up crossing something out because you didn't see the cheat sheet, the answer. And you put that box in a different spot 
we'll move it, you know, if it's not convenient to move, you know, uh, draw an arrow, draw a long arrow, you know, make sure the arrow lands in the direction it should, and then uh, if you want to move it, that would be even better. We go in and look at the durations. Duration for A is three. We put the number three, this box that we've drawn has kind of an imaginary nine sectors in it, if you want to kind of use that. Uh, that's not a hard and fast rule because we've already seen a movie that used two different notations on it. So this is their notation right now. It works. Uh, you can use it or you can invent your own notation that, but then nobody can bail you out. If you lose track of yours, uh, people can't read yours and understand it unless you teach them. So you're welcome to do that. In this case, we're putting the duration in the top middle sector of the box. So we see the duration for A is three, the duration for E is two, the duration for F is seven, the duration for B is one, duration for C is five, duration for D is eight, we want to make sure that D has uh, the letter C and H to the left of it, and it does. Uh, the duration for C was five, duration for B was one, duration for G is four, A is to the left of it, duration for H is six, G is to the left of that, uh, D has two to the left, C and H, we've already talked about that, and then we've got the end, and to the left of end, is D and F, so that means the arrows have to point to the end, and that gives us the beginning and end, and we have arrows. So the next thing we want to do, Brad gets signed in and we need five, we need five sheets of paper. And we haven't gotten very far, so we'll catch up in our feet. So next, Let's see, we did everything. We checked everything in the PDM diagram against the table. We made sure that the information on our table has been accurately represented in this drawing, which is not complete. But if your sequence looks something like this, it's, it's right. And if you chose to put the box for F right here on top of the box for C, and the arrow is a short arrow, and then you got a long arrow pointing to the end, that's fine. You know, however you want to do it, maybe maybe you like them laid out in a different way. Uh, that's completely fine. You're the project manager. All you have to do is teach everybody else what the what the map means. Show them what the map means. So next, we're going to identify all the unique paths through the diagram. It tells us there are three paths through this diagram, but if they didn't tell us that, you could look at this diagram the way it is drawn. And you can see that there should be three paths. Because when we get to A, there are three choices in the road. If this was a street, we could go three different streets. So that means there has to be three paths through the, even if this street only goes to this one spot and then comes back to the main road, that's still a separate path. Even if it only deviates from one path, right? So, so in this one, we can see that there's three tasks. We can see here there's where there's two roads merged together. Here's where two roads merge together, but they're already on one of the other three streets. So as you look at this, you just kind of have to look, at, step back for a second, let logic go with you. Um, what's the first obvious path where we typically read from top to the bottom? So what is it, left to right. So reading left to right, and by the way, there's not a rule that this has to be left to right. Your start could be on the right side of the page. You can go back, just label it so that people can follow your map. I typically go left or right because I was taught to read that way. Uh, Arab countries and Japan, they read other directions, so maybe their preference would be to map it a different way. That's fine, just don't let it trick you. Read the labels. Make sure you start with the start. So one of the paths would be what? A, E, F, and we can say start, A, E, F, N. And that's what they did here. They, they, they've used that one as a third one. 
they start A E F N. That's one of the paths. The straight through path is another path. And what is that one? That's the first one they depicted. Start A B C D N. And they wrote them down. And then the third path is start A G H D N. So now we take those three paths, they just wrote them down in order. And now, instead of writing the letters for the tasks, they write the number of how long the duration is from our table. They're taking this, this is no new information. This is just copied from the table. So you copy it from the table, and we have A is a task that takes three units. B is a task that takes one. C is a task that takes five. And D is a task that takes eight. It says so in the boxes, and it says so on the table. They're in order on the boxes, because we've connected them with arrow. On the table, they're not in order. So we add those up, and we see that, that one path is 17 units, one path is 21 units, and one path is 12 units. So what is the critical path? The AGHD. The AGHD, the longest one, it takes 21 hours, days, weeks, whatever our units are, hopefully it's not years, but that's the longest one. So that's the critical path. That's the one that's gonna screw up our deadline if something goes wrong. On the other two paths, we have some float. Right now, we don't know how much float, but we have some float, or we have some slack. These paths, these tasks, E, F, G, and H, can move around a little bit, and it won't screw up our end deadline. We, we need to know how much, but uh, because maybe we could, you know, task F has got seven units attached to it, but let's say that maybe you know we 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 could we could speed up uh, task D by taking one of those you know one of the people and move them over to D to kind of maybe speed D up because we can make F a little bit late without sacrificing right so we could redistribute our labor redistribute our resources possibly in the in the management of this project all right so the critical path has 21 periods, whatever those periods are. So we're now going to drop in early start, early finishes. But notice what number we start with. We start with the number one. And one of the movies we watched warned us that it's easier to start with the number zero because we don't have to do as much math and we all just listened to them and didn't know what that meant. Now we're going to see what that meant. It's not hard math. You have to subtract one. Subtracting one isn't really hard, but you got to do it. If you don't do it, you'll have the wrong numbers in here. So let's follow this through slowly so we can drop the right numbers in each corner of our diagram. So let's read what we're going to do. ES, we said, stands for early start and early finish, or calculating related by doing a forward pass through the diagram, and then we're going to do a backwards pass later. The forward pass, the early start of the activities after the start node is 1. They're starting at, at the digit 1. We could start it at the z digit 0, but we're following their math, and this is an acceptable practice. The early finish of an activity is its early start plus its duration plus one. minus one. That's a curveball. We didn't do that when we watched the movie So, because we started with zero. If you started with zero on activity A, the duration is three. If we started with zero, zero plus three equals three. But because we started with one, we go, 1 plus 3 is 4, minus 1 is 3. So, that's a brain bender. Don't ask me why. I can't, I can't explain to you why. They, you asked me that last class, and I gave you a half-assed answer. 
I don't, I don't have a better answer yet. Uh, it, it, I, I don't know why. They start with one. Wouldn't it be easier to start zero. with zero then if you're going to end up with the same number? Go ahead and start with zero. That's what the video we watched before recommended. That's what I've always done. But I'm telling you, everybody else doesn't. And when you looked at this and you saw the one in there, you didn't know how they came up with three unless you know the rule. Hey, if you start with the one, you got to you got to add and, and subtract. So over here, um, we 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 take uh, the the we add one. We take four plus one. I mean three plus one, and that's four. Uh, we add two. Uh, that's six, and we subtract one, and that's five. Why do we do it that way? <laughs> you guys that studied lean go, that got, ain't lean. Somebody got bored. <laughs> somebody got bored. <laughs> Some so mathematician. <laughs> the math guys like to always throw curves to us, uh, and there's the curve. But <laughs> fortunately, it's fairly simple what they're doing because you, you can follow it, right? So we have five plus one is six that goes as on our forward pass. Plus seven is 13, minus one is 12. All right, so 12 is our, our, our cumulative time frame for that, that path. Uh, the, the, the path that we know to be the critical path, we start with one, we add three, that's four. Uh, minus one is three. Uh, we, three plus one is four. Uh, minus, uh, four plus one is five, minus one is four. I'm sorry, I got to do this out loud, but that's the right way to do it. Uh, no wonder you guys scratching your head without explanation when you look through this. Uh, I, I apologize that I didn't give you a tutorial as we went through it. Four uh, plus one is five. Five plus five is ten. Minus one is nine. Uh, nine plus one is ten. Uh, where did 14 come from? Well, we got two arrows pointing there. And when there's two arrows pointing there, we take the highest, if we're doing a forward pass, we take the highest number. In this case, it's going to come from square H. We don't know that yet, so we would have filled in 9 plus 1 is 10, uh, 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 and, and that's going to give you, uh, I'm sorry, 5 plus 5 is 10, uh, minus 1 is 9, 9 plus 1 is uh, 10, 10, but we, the 10 is going to get erased when we come through and do this path, because it's going to, we're going to take the longest the longest, uh, the biggest number on the forward path. Did I? With two converging arrows like that, yep. you would stop at C before you do D. I, I would just to get H filled in because I know I'm going to have to race. Or, or it's a 50 50 chance that I'm going to have to do the critical path first. That way you don't have any of those. If you know the critical path, um, that's fine. Yeah, you, well, since it has you calculated out earlier on, we did do your answer like that, so just figure it out. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so once we've done all the pluses and minuses and all of that, uh, we now have data. No, oh, no, we've got to do a backwards pass next. The backwards pass is the, uh, the earliest finish, 21, uh, uh, minus 8 uh, plus 1, right? And so we go backwards through this the whole thing uh, that way with the la latest finish and the latest start. Uh, and when we are done with that, we have this drawn out. Hopefully you've got that drawn out with those numbers on it now. So you can refer to it later if you get a test like a test question like a network diagram and asking you to do one, which could happen. If it does, it'll be open book. And if it does, I would suggest you use zeros as you start. Uh, but you won't have to worry, I won't, I won't trick you with this. So the early start of activity D is what? 14. That's the earliest start. The latest start of activity F is? So earliest six, latest is 15. Right? The earliest finish for activity B, the earliest finish is four. four. The latest finish for activity E is there. The latest finish is 14. All right, so we answered their five questions. And now we go back to exercise two. Which is we have a bigger table. Given the following activities, 
What is a critical path? Now we have a curve ball on this one also because we have more than one thing that is uh, a press, uh, a, a start as a press predecessor. And we have end being predecessed by three activities. So we've got the questions, what's the float? What's the early start for I? What's the early finish for D? Uh, by the way, we did talk about what the float was on that one we just did. We may go back and, and look at that for a second in a, in a, in a minute. But we're gonna go through exercise two. Okay. I was going around the room and having you read a sentence and that didn't seem right, so I'm just reading it. Uh, so you can be drawing, because I want you to take a new sheet of paper, landscape mode. Begin by drawing the activity on node, the PDM precedence diagram method, uh, based on the activities, predecessors, and durations of the table. That's exactly what we did last time. Begin with the start mode node, and then add the activities having start as their predecessors, which is activities A and E. Next, add the activities those as pre their predecessor, uh, B as activity A as its predecessor, and activities J and F have activity E as a predecessor. Continue until the end is reached, and then add the durations into the activity nodes. Check your work that everything in the PDM diagram uh, uh, is represented properly from the table. So, if I don't go to the cheat and look, my start for me is going to be all the way to the left. To the right of the start button, I'm going to have two boxes. And those boxes are going to be labeled what? A and E. A and E. Now, uh, so now what you could do is scan column the second column, for the letter A. And you will see the letter A is only associated with activity B. So B has to be to the right of letter activity A. We also have a box with the letter E on it, connected to the start button. Scan the column, the predecessor column, for the letter E. And now we will see it a couple of times. We will see activity F, and we see activity J, and we see activity, is that it? That's it. That's it. So we've got uh, F and J to the right of E. So we can go now look for the letter F, and we can see that F is to the left of letter G, right? And we've got letter F associated with N. F is a pre predecessor of N, meaning F is to the left or the right, which is it? F is to the left. Uh, F is to the left of the letter N. Now let's cheat for a second and see what we're looking at. Maybe something that's going to end up something like this. So we need five sheets of paper blank there. Get it by the sign in sheet. And because we had an hour time change, it looks like you're real late. Because we just started. To <laughs> I know. It's dark outside. It's like, oh, God, it's late. time to go. Yeah. <laughs> Feels like bedtime. <laughs> so, we have a couple of maybe curveballs on this. Uh, to the left of the letter K. We have uh, K 
see F being listed twice. We already knew that. We will see I being listed twice. We will see the N being listed three times. N is the predecessor, of the predecessor to N is D, I, and M. Alright, so we've, we've drawn something like this, your own version of it. Take the time to draw the boxes. There will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen boxes plus the start and the end. So you'll have sixteen boxes in there. And it doesn't matter really where the boxes are at, it matters that the arrows connect them this way. So like an electrical circuit. You know, you have to connect the ends but it doesn't matter where it's at in your car. If you got a wire going through the part, it connects it, it could be a short wire, a looped wire, a long wire, it doesn't matter. Uh, same thing here with the president's diagram. It's simply showing the wire as an arrow here, and somehow the letter B has to be connected behind the letter A, downstream from the letter A, and the letter B, the activity B, has to be upstream from C and K. However you make that drawing, that's what it has to be. What did they do next after they had this and they put the durations on the top center of the box? What did they do next on the first exercise? Path. What are all of the paths? Identify the paths and from that the critical path will be the one that the durations all add up to the shortest or the longest. The longest. So the durations that add up to the longest will be the critical path. So as we look at this from the start, we can go in two directions, to the A or the E. So clearly there's got to be two paths. We have another fork in the road between B and we have another fork in the road at E. We have another fork in the road at F. So we've got several paths through here. We have five. So let's write each of the five paths down as you look at your drawing. All of them start with start, and they go either start to A or start to E. So that's the first of all of them. Start to A, so you can say start A, B, C, D, N. That's one possible path. Another possible path is start A, B, K, L, M, N. That's two. Another possible path would be start E, J, K, L, M, N. Another one would be start E, F, G, H, I, N. And the last possible path would be start E, F, N, O, I, N. So if you draw, draw those, or write those five possible paths down, you don't have to memorize them, you don't have to try to remember the numbers, simply write them down. After you've written them down, go back to your diagram, and you are going to write the duration time that's associated with each letter, and since there's 16 13 tasks. Now that's more than you can remember, so you just got to look back and forth. Uh, they are in order on the table, so that might be your fastest way to go and get the right duration to add in. In this case, the first path that I named was A, B, C, D, and 
that's 3 plus 2 plus 5 plus 1, that says that path takes 11 time periods. The next one that they have in the book, um, the test question is EFGHI. That equates to 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 1 or 13. Their third one is EJKLM, and that is 24425, for a total of 17. Then they have ABKLM for a duration of 3 plus 2 plus 4 plus 2 plus 5, totaling 16. And finally, they have EFNOI. 2 plus 1 plus 5 plus 3 plus 1 is 12. So we have durations in the path going from 11 to 17, 17 being the biggest number. So the critical path is the EJKLM. EJKLM. That path is the critical path. I have the most amount of slop in ABCD. Second in EFNLI, third in EFGHI, uh, fourth in ABKLM, and the critical path is the longest one, EJKLM. So if we went through, the next step on that would be to do a forward pass and a backwards pass. We've got some more examples here. Let's just follow the questions because what it's doing is answering the questions that were asked us in the exercise. So, what is the float activity for? What is the float for activity F? What is the early start for activity I? What's the early finish for activity D? What's the late start for activity N? What's the late finish for activity M? So, to answer those in that order. how long an activity's duration can extend before it lengthens the project duration. So we need to use the path durations we found in question six, those paths. The flow for any activity on the critical path is zero, so they're the easiest to fill in. The flow of activities E, J, K, L, and M are all zero. So you see the float, they put it, filled it in in this red brown. Zero, 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 Flow for non-critical activities is the critical path duration minus the duration of the activity's path. The flow for activity N is 1, 17 minus 16. The flow for activity O is 5, 17 <coughs> minus 12. If an activity is on multiple paths, its flow is the one that is the least. We have several activities that are on more than one path. For activity A, it's on one path with a duration of 11, and a float of 6, and another with a duration of 16, and a float of 1. We choose the float that is the least, so activity A has a float of 1. So you can fill in that information. We haven't filled in earliest start, earliest finish, latest start, latest finish notice. We just looked at the float, figuring it out a different way than we figured it out before. Float is also the difference between uh, early start and late start, right? The lowest completed network diagram for this exercise. Early start and early finish are calculated within your forward pass through the program diagram. The early start of the activities after the start node is one. The early finish of an activity is its early start plus its duration minus one. We already drove you nuts with that already. ES is the EF of the predecessor activity plus one. There are multiple predecessor activities. Use the greatest. 
and we do a backward pass. We can do it by path if we want, or we can just do it. I mean, that's the best way to do it. Do it by path. We we know what the longest path is. So the early start for activity I is 13. The early finish for activity D is 11. The late start for activity N is 9. And the late finish for activity M is 17. So if we've done those little math exercises, we've come up with that chart, and we have finished the exercise. We've done two of these. We have one more I want us to do, and I think that we ought to do it before we go to break. And then it'll be time for break. So let's go through the other one. And this introduces something new that you want to Google up on your phone. So we have the exercise on critical path. Let me blow this up a little bit so that it's easier to read. Okay. When we are looking at precedence, you could use the word dependency. This table uses a different term than precedence. It's okay. Precedence and dependency are the same. This task is dependent on the task that needs to be precedent to it. Uh, so, uh, and they put the duration in a different column. And they've added a couple of things that are deliverables, and they might be things like uh, a, a moment in time when you have to have a building inspector, and they've gotta come through and look at your electrical wiring and your plumbing before the sheetrock guys put the sheetrock on the wall. The building inspector has to come sign off on your electrical work and your plumbing work while they can see inside the wall, right? So that may be a deliverable A. A deliverable A is a, a uh, electrical and plumbing inspection. And, and so that would be a milestone in the project as a deliverable because there's an activity that needs to happen at that inspection. It could be anything, it's a milestone basically, the deliverable A and deliverable B uh, are dependent on certain tasks being done and then you move on. And so in this one we have that and we also have something labeled SS for task nine. We haven't seen that before. And uh, we are gonna look at SS and FS dependencies. Pick up your cell phone if you would, if you've got one handy, and look up FS dependency or SS dependency and tell me what it means when you look that up. Might have to add project management to it, though. They might give you a, a porn site or something. Finish what? Start to finish. Start to finish. So finish to start. Finish to start. Finish one task till the start of another task. That's a finish start dependency. And that's the term, that's the shorthand that's used in project management. Program. We haven't seen that. We haven't talked about that. We haven't mentioned it in class until today. What's SS? Start to start. A start to start dependency. So we just saw that on our table. Task nine has a one start start dependency. We don't know how to map that. That's not an uncommon thing. And if you cheat and look ahead a little bit, we're going to put a dummy task in there that is the start start between task one and task nine. Both of them have to have this event occur, which is the same as the event in blue, but for some reason the project management guys like to put a ghost uh, label in there. It's not a wrong way. It's not necessary, in my opinion. Uh, it does map it a little more clearly, uh, but let's go through it now that we know what those abbreviations stand for. 
So we're, we look at the table. From that table, you're going to draw the map that you just saw a sneak preview on. But let's talk about the why for each of these pieces. The critical path is still the same. It's the chain of activities which determines the project end date. Delay any activity in the critical path by an arbitrarily small amount, and the plan will be delayed. The determination of the critical path is based on the computation of the slack of each activity, computed by determining the earliest and latest starts or ends of each task in the plan. This data, in fact, allows us to compute the slack of each activity. The critical path is a path in which all activities have no slack at all, zero slack. Computation is performed starting from the a arrow on no activity on node representation of the plan. First step is pre-processing the plan by transforming all dependencies into finish start dependencies. What has to finish before the next thing can start? Same thing we've been doing. It's just a different label for it, FS. It's a different word for what we've been doing. In the case of the ex this exercise, we have a uh, SS is start start dependency between task one and task nine. This is solved by adding a dummy node representing the start of the first task. In our example, we can transform it into an FS dependency by adding a dummy node, task one S, on which task one and task nine depend with an F a, a finish start dependency. This is equivalent to promoting the start of task one to a node with zero duration. So it's a ghost doesn't matter that much. I would not call you wrong if you put both of these tasks above box two in parallel. It's just another way of drawing the same thing, but you will hear project managers talk about this, and you'll see dummy nodes on project plans, and you go, what the heck is that, and why did they do that? So, the rest of the notation is pretty similar to what we've been using. <coughs> Early start, early finish in the top two corners of the box. Late start, late finish, uh, late end, uh, uh, on the uh, bottom corners. The duration, the name of the task, and slack being what they're putting in the middle and the top of the box. Notice we've added the dummy node TD to manage the SS dependency between task one and task nine. For all tasks, we use notation which allows us to record all relevant information from a task, namely the earliest start, the duration, earliest end, latest start, slack, and the latest end. Only for the sake of clarity, we've used a circle for the deliveries, uh, deliverables. We'll have to change it. They're going to change that to the box uh, in the next diagrams. So let's go to those next diagrams. That box is a fan box as well, based on the deliverable moment that they want to have little celebration, pizza party, some sort of deliverable. Uh, uh, we transfer title here, and there's some payment activities that happen after that, or whatever it is. So first, we perform the forward pass to complete the early start and end dates of each task. The earliest start and end of the start activity are zero. What did we use last time? We used one. So this time, we'll do simpler math. We'll use zeros. We compute a task earliest start by taking the highest earliest end of the predecessors. The earliest end is computed by summing a task duration to the earliest start. Uh, the result of computation is shown below. This is a forward pass. Um, task one, it says on our table, is for a duration of four. So we put that in there as a zero plus four a earliest end of four. So there our math is now simpler. We don't add one and subtract one when we move from box to box. This is straightforward the way we've been doing it, probably the way I would recommend that you continue to do it. So you go through the forward pass and you fill in the boxes on the top. Remember when we have multiple uh, tasks uh, uh, coming into a spot, here we have task four goes to deliverable A, task three goes to deliverable A, task one goes to deliverable A. We have a four early finish, a six early finish, and a two early finish. So on the forward pass, we go to the six. The largest is the one we carry forward. And we've done that here. 
with the six, we've done it with the 12, because task seven only take, only finishes eight, but we can't move that on because we're waiting for task six to get done, and that early is finished as 12. So 12 gets carried forward, deliverable B has no time associated with it, and so that automatically is the early finish. That goes to our end, uh, early finish for uh, this path uh, in, for, the, for this, for this uh, 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 plan is 12 weeks, days, hours, minutes, seconds, whatever units of time we're using. Now we go backwards, but right now they're introducing a new tool. They're putting a Gantt chart in place. You have this in a handout. If you picked it up, I have five or six extra copies. Some of you were not here uh, and didn't get a handout. Uh, it is up on Canvas. Uh, they, they, I have a few extra copies of this if you want to see the Gantt charting a little bit more clearly. This corresponds to setting all constraints of activities to as soon as possible, or pulling the task to the left as shown by corresponding Gantt diagram. So in other words, going through this thing, if we map it out, we still have a critical path, but we, we have certain things that we can just start them right away. Like for example, task one, task two, and task four all have some slack associated with them because, uh, well, at least task one does. Uh, task one, you can move it to the right and you still wouldn't miss your deadline uh, between week six and seven, whatever that date is. Uh, this blue bar could slide to the right and you wouldn't have a problem. But so for this first pass, they're slid all the bars as far left as they can slide them. These two can't fly, slide further left because they can't start until this one finishes. This one can't slide any further to the left because it can't start until this one finishes. So we've got a map here that shows a critical path, uh, and which, which by the way is, is task four, task three, task six. Now the backwards pass, we're gonna add more numbers to the boxes. We perform the backwards. Somebody have a question? No? Okay. Then we perform the backwards pass to compute the latest date. Starting from the end node, uh, latest start, latest end, or set to the earliest end, we set task latest end by taking the lowest, uh, latest end to all the successors. We then compute the latest start by subtracting the tax duration to its latest end. Results shown on the file following diagram. So we do that same thing backwards. But this time, going backwards, where we have multiple things going into uh, a, we have a 10 and a 6 from task 6 and task 7 uh, going into the vulnerable A. We take the smaller of the two, which is 6, and drop that down into backwards path. It's forwards pass, it's the larger. Backwards pass, it's the smaller. That's not news. We remember that. So now, this corresponds to setting the constraints of all the activities in the plan to as late as possible, or pushing all the tasks to the right as shown by the following Gantt diagram. So this Gantt diagram is the same project as this Gantt diagram is, but if you look at the sequence that we're starting things in, on the first diagram, Gantt diagram, we're starting everything as quickly as we can. On the second one, we're putting it off as long as we can and we're still making the end deadline. So we've got movement in when we do different tasks, except for the critical path tasks. Those are still done in the same sequence. Task uh, two, task uh, three, task six, critical path. We now can compute the slack as a difference between earliest end and earliest start, or the latest end and latest start equivocally. Critical path is made of all the tasks with zero slack, shown in red. So as we look, the difference of task two between the earliest start and, and earliest finish is zero. Uh, I mean the latest start and earliest finish is six and six and zero. Six and six is zero. Twelve and twelve is zero. Um, so that's our critical path, task two, three, six. 
That's our critical path. If we compare the two Gantt charts, the critical path is exactly the set of activities we start and end dates did not change when we change the constraints from as soon as possible to as late as possible. So that's what we do there. That was quick for us to go through. Take you a little time to draw that one. We had a couple of curve balls. We're back to more comfortable math, starting with zeros. But we've been through this a few times now. This, I want us to, when we do our Christmas party plan, we need to come up with our table. And you can use precedence or dependency on your table. Duration could be in the middle column or the end column, your call. Uh, of how you sequence the things for your party. And, and everybody's homework or every team's homework will be different because you'll have different tasks for your party. Some of you will have a more fun party than others will. Uh, and uh, you'll have more stuff, more complication, better entertainment or whatever. And so no, I understand that your charts won't be the same, uh, but uh, I want you to come up with the table and I want you to map it and um, I want you to make Agile and Scrum into uh, the process. So we're going to take a break now. Come back in 10 minutes. And I think we'll start our Christmas plan. Uh, we'll get our teams re identified and maybe re situated. We're going 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right now. So take a break. We'll see you in 10 minutes. they keep the road open as long as they're just up to their own or? Uh -uh. Um, it's not that far up, I think, that people actually just have to ride snowmobiles in. Yeah. Yeah, so they'll keep it, uh, I think, to like Hot Valley, past Hot Valley a little ways, but. I don't know the landmarks, but I, I, I went up there one again, time where I thought it was pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And then I got to a spot where the mountain was in the shadow and They don't really clear our road very yeah. early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get snowed in sometimes, but not often. It would be kind of fun if it happened when we had some flexibility. <laughs> that would be so nice. But it I, probably does. I wish this week I would get snowed in. <laughs> Pray for snow. All things could happen. <laughs>
yourself and more on the house floor. You know what I mean? People aren't really happy people. people there, so, yeah. I'm trying to both out at the same time. But we need to just like use the music back in the house. I was in the middle of 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 the house. I was in
going to go through, uh, we'll go, we're going to redivide in teams. I can't, we counted off into groups of three and that was wrong and, 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 and then we didn't have a meeting right after that. So we're going to do that again, except this time I get 12 in the room, I think, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 11, 12, 13 in the room. Uh, and uh, uh, so we'll, we'll get in groups of three and one group of four and to do that we'd count to four. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Add zero plus one minus one and we'll have it. Yeah. You know, okay. I think we'll do that. We'll count to four. Four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. Did you say two? Yeah. Three. Four. <laughs> okay, so right now uh, we're going to get four groups One's in that corner, two's in that corner, three's up here, and four's over there. Uh, and here's your, you're going to plan a Christmas party for the company. And it's the company. You make up the company. It could be IBM if you want, or it could be one of the companies that you work for. Uh, you are going to define the scope of the project, which means you're going to answer questions like, who's going to get invited? Is it just employees? Is it just full-time employees? Uh, is it employees plus significant others, kids invited? Those questions are going to be included in the scope of the project. Then you're going to talk about what, when, where, who, how you're going to do it. Does it have entertainment? Does it have food? Uh, do you, where are you going to meet? Is it going to be on the lake? Where is it going to be? What are you going to do? Uh, we're going to target a budget of, of 10 bucks a person, uh, that which is a, 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 a prohibitive target if you decide you need a different target than that as a team that's fine uh, what I want you to do is you're going to create a project plan from that project plan you're going to identify tasks you're going to build a network diagram of those tasks and the the uh, the hand out hand in to me will be that so you're going to get started today you're going to make some assignments of how you're going to do it and uh, whether you have a project manager or whether you have a scrum master, this is going to be the, up to you and your team of how you want to do it. Uh, and then you will turn that in to me at some point. It won't be Thursday. Today is Tuesday. It won't be Thursday. It'll be next week at the soonest. It might be after Thanksgiving. Uh, so you'll have a few, a little bit of time to work on uh, the diagrams and getting it this is a real world example so I, if you can apply agile principles of what we know so far do that put some scrums or some uh, sprints in there of how you want to do it uh, but you're making the plan this is the plan you're not going to actually execute it unless you want to have a party uh, in which case uh, we'll talk but this is you're making the plan uh, and so this is the project plan so diagrams are good Gantt charts are good 
uh, oh, whatever wow. kinds of uh, means you yeah. want to communicate, come up with that. And we're going to give you about 30 minutes to work on it right now. Then we're going to have a little wrap up on Agile, and we'll be done for the day. Okay? Or is it just whatever they paint? Or what we want to do? We want to just reduce our inventory. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, the Christmas one. We got the test in the Christmas party. I just threw it in there and my call order. Oh, that's what we're going to do. What are we going to do?
<laughs> on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can you assign them. seats? But normally we do games, like we've done um, minute to minute games, and I mean, we have like cookies, guns, all kinds of stuff. But this year it should be like such a vibe. That's what I'm saying. I need to pass that. And we have to think of it for that. But um, yeah, this year it's been really simplified. My friend is having surgery, but the other girl's going out of town. So, how much in gift cards? Um, I think, so for 30 people, and we, we let the spouses participate too, so they, I would say we like an average of about $75 each person, um, so I'm going to try and use 60 people, yeah, see what it's about. Okay. That's a great number. $4,500. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is a lot. But on an individual basis, it's not. I yeah. know, I know. And we usually, and usually, oh, and another thing, we play bingo all the time, and everybody wants to, yeah. Cause I, I don't know. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, is it so it's the gift card? It's for the entertainment and a gift. Yeah. I mean, that's in place in our community. We work. So what if you did like have that big gift card that would have one day? So just a fun or a better gift card. So we'll go. We could just that. pay like thirty dollars for a gift card. Or you could do eighteen hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Uh, what's our budget on this? Whatever, Whatever you want it to be. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's not so.
be day one because we always look at <laughs> we got to put the test first, you know. this do? When is this due? I just nailed it down. It's going to be due November 17th, a week from Thursday. Are we going to have additional class time to plan? Uh, probably not. Okay. Try to make it so we're doing it. They will send out invites. Like you have to make Today. it so like kind of close. Yeah, you have, you have, you have, have to have, to have, have to tell them how many people you have. You have to have the mini plans and then like you have to give them a rough count and then it gets like uh, you okay. them a wall count. So we go, should we go till the 24th for invites? So we send out, let's say we send out invites.
I'll do food. Yep. Now is the company. It's all good. I got so many. It's all day. I have to look at each other. I really remember the chicks. So. Who's gonna send out the invites? I can. Yeah, I can make some really cheap. Can't do it all. There we go. All right. This is just. This is creating. So what's next? Who's going to? Uh, I guess we need to send some in charge of get a gift card. With all that. We got gift cards. What are you going to do? I am going to <laughs> put the gift cards on the chair. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. to tell them how much this one is $15. they are all $15. We've got $100 in the lights. they got to type it in. We've got to confirm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. It is. That's the thing. That was a thousand. All right. So, I think I want $200. How long does it take to get gift cards? We're talking about $1,800 gift cards. If we get a one day event, let's say the week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only six years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, spread for money. Sounds like you yeah. probably want to spread that out. Yeah. 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 yeah, it sounds like you want to spread that out. Yeah. 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 Maggie's doing it on Monday morning, 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 morning at 7 o'clock. Oh, you're picking up gift cards for like three months. You know what I mean? It is such a thing. I guess it's just not too good. Gosh, you don't believe it. Really? Really? Yeah. Really? You can do that, but then you're stuck in like three because you get like a pack of four that are hot. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can go. Okay, so you pick up the gift cards to give you a week. Um, it's just a three hours in progress. Send me the invites back to the day. How long does it take to send out the Yeah. Oh, 
Two minutes and then we're going to shift focus. So make, make sure you have contacts for each other and action plan. Seven thirty. I'm going to switch topics to agile. Review that a little bit. So hopefully you've made some plans for what you're doing next on your your, your uh, project team. And uh, if you didn't catch the announcement, a week from Thursday is when this will be due. And I'd like uh, uh, just kind of a report from each of the four teams as to what you're where you're at, and what you did. If you're if you're done, and if you're not, kind of where it's at. Show us what you've got done uh, a week from Thursday. Uh, it is 7.30. It is election night. The polls are open to 8 tonight. If any of you forgot to vote and you want to vote, Dixie Convention Center is the polling place. If you are registered to vote, you are dismissed to go vote if you promise to go vote. Uh, it's, it's an election. If you'd slip by and you want to do that, sneak out and go vote, you got... Uh, if you get there by 8, they will count your vote, uh, so even if the line is longer and it's after 8 when you cast the vote. That's the law in Utah. So uh, feel free to to do that. It's important that, that we uh, vote. Whether we think it makes a difference or not, there are many, many countries where they don't have the right to vote. And I think that's something we want to preserve uh, as much as we possibly can in an orderly fashion being able to, to vote in what we hope is not a rigged election. <laughs> we, we've had some dispute over that, but all in all, I think we're doing a pretty good job 
uh, in America with withholding or with upholding our uh, right to vote and have an influence. So with that, uh, we're going to talk about Agile a little bit. I want to remind you four little cartoon kind of videos uh, that we will look at. This is, remember, Agile's roots are in software. And so this is going back to those roots and talking about kind of where Agile has come from. Again, we've, we've been talking about it, but I'm asking you as part of this assignment to include a user story uh, as part of your project plan. So what are the user stories? So if you haven't been thinking in terms of, of, of Agile and the scrums or sprints that you need to do on your project, bake that into your thinking. Just remind yourself what user stories. We'll look at two videos on user stories. And, uh, and in fact, one of them will talk about the difference between uh, user cases and user stories. And so uh, we, there, one is from the perspective of, of of what happens with the project and the other is from the perspective of what happens to the customer. So we'll start with a review of what is Agile methodology, four minutes. We've got about 30 minutes of video clips in these four videos we're gonna watch. That will take us till eight o'clock and we'll be done with class at that point. So this is a reminder of what we've learned in Agile, Scrum, and user Agile is a set of values and principles, yet people are constantly asking about Agile methodology. If you want to know more about Agile values and principles, take a look at my video called What is Agile? In this video, we're going to try to answer what is Agile methodology? This is a bit of a trick question. A methodology is a body of methods, procedures, and rules for a particular discipline, but Agile values and principles explicitly avoid prescribing any particular methods or procedures. Agile doesn't specify methods. Agile is not a methodology. This is probably a surprise for many people, but if you really take the time to look at the Agile values and principles, you won't find any methodology there. Instead, you will find guidance on how to choose methods and procedures that will work best for your team. The Agile values and principles don't try to prescribe the way your team should work. Instead, they focus on helping you and your team think and interact in ways that achieve agility. Agility is the ability to continually adapt, the ability to constantly make improvements to the way you work. Understanding this is important because it explains why Agile explicitly avoids being a methodology. If Agile specified a methodology, it would necessarily be, well, less Agile, less able to adapt to the specific circumstances of your team in your organization. So instead of telling you explicitly what to do, Agile gives you some values and principles that your team can use to decide what you should do. So if Agile is not a methodology, what about all the specific things you hear about Agile teams doing? What about stand-up meetings, product demos, retrospectives, planning poker, etc.? While Agile is not a methodology, there are a number of methodologies teams can use to follow the Agile principles and values. Take Scrum, for instance. Scrum specifies a number of specific ways for teams to work. This includes things like having daily stand-ups, fixed-length sprints, product demos, and retrospectives. Many teams find Scrum to be a very good way of following Agile values and principles. It provides a powerful methodology that assists in following Agile, but it is important to note that just following these ceremonies doesn't make a team Agile. They have to be following these ceremonies because it helps them align with the Agile values and principles. As a side note, some people will argue that Scrum is a framework and thus more flexible than a methodology, but the line between the two is fairly fuzzy, nuanced, and often depends on whether or not someone has negative connotations of the word methodology. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm using methodology, but in a positive sense. Scrum gives you powerful methods and processes for getting work done. Extreme programming is another methodology that you'll encounter in software development. It includes a number of practices like test-driven development and pair programming. The extreme programming methodology gives teams methods and processes that can be used to follow Agile values and principles. For example, Agile principles say that teams should leverage change as a competitive advantage. XP practices give methods for writing software that enables this. So why do people still refer to Agile as a methodology? 
usually because they are confusing Agile, the values and principles, with the methods and methodologies people use to follow those principles. If your team is truly trying to follow Agile principles and values, your methodology will evolve over time as your team grows and adapts. After all, that is what it means to be Agile. It may seem like a small thing, but every like and every subscription is very appreciated. a reminder of what we already knew, once again, uh, emphasizing the software uh, part of it, but we all uh, want to be more flexible and more continuous improvement in our focus, and that is Agile. Now, same guy, what is Scrum? <coughs> what is Scrum? Like Agile, it depends on who you ask, which means that no matter what I say in this video, someone's going to disagree, so feel free to let me have it in the comments. Scrum.org says that Scrum is a simple framework for effective team collaboration on complex projects. It goes on to say that Scrum is not a methodology because it's flexible, but that you aren't doing Scrum if you modify it in any way. Of course, this sounds suspiciously like a methodology. I'm not pointing this out to criticize Scrum, but it's important to recognize that Scrum means very different things to different people. And the words framework and methodology also get used in a variety of different ways, so expect some ambiguity in what labels apply to Scrum, even if you're meticulous about defining your terms. Fortunately, looking at what Scrum actually is tends to be a whole lot easier than classifying it, so let's start there. First, it's important to note that Scrum rests on three pillars, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. These are important because they really help provide much greater context to the other parts of Scrum. You'll see them present as we look at Scrum's primary components, roles, events, and artifacts. More recently, Scrum has added values as well, but those aren't part of this video. Scrum defines specific roles. There's a product owner, Hello. a scrum master, Hi. and a development team. Each role has different responsibilities, but at a high level, the product owner is responsible for defining and sequencing the work that is to be done. <laughs> the scrum master keeps things organized and helps remove impediments that could slow down the development team. And the development team does the work. This could be developing software or other types of work. Scrum also defines a number of events. First, there's the sprint. The sprint is a time-boxed, fixed-length iteration, typically two weeks in length, but no more than four weeks. Whatever length of iteration is chosen, the team sticks with it. It doesn't vary from iteration to iteration. The whole team collaboratively defines a scope of work to achieve a goal or business objective that's valuable to the product owner, and then makes their best effort to complete that body of work during the sprint. They may succeed or fail to complete all the work, but the sprint cadence remains the same either way. Unfinished work can be assigned to the next sprint if it's still valuable to the product owner. In some teams, the sprint may be referred to as an increment. For example, a consultant working with Verizon quickly discovered that using the term sprint didn't go over very well. <laughs> I doubt if a scrum trainer would last very long trying to get everyone at sprint to refer to iterations as Verizons. Sprint planning and I'm back to talking about the iteration, not the telecommunication company. So sprint iteration planning is where the team defines the work and the goal they want to achieve in the upcoming sprint. This is a collaborative effort and involves the whole team having discussions about what has a valuable return on investment and what is possible to actually accomplish within the bounds of the sprint. Now let's look at the daily scrum. This is a daily 15 minute time box meeting for the team to coordinate their work toward achieving the sprint goal. This is often called the daily standup as many teams have found standing helps achieve the time box of 15 minutes, keep everyone from falling asleep and off their phones and computers. Some teams go around and have each person say what they did yesterday, what they plan to do today and if they have any impediments. Regardless of what methods used, the scrum provides a daily touch point to achieve transparency and to quickly adapt to changes and new information. I usually recommend that teams trying to follow Agile principles refer to this meeting as the daily face-to-face -face meeting because it helps keep everyone focused on the Agile principle of face-to-face -face communication.
This is probably a good point to talk about where the term scrum comes from. <laughs> In rugby, a scrummage is a way to restart the play, where players pack tightly together and lock heads with the opposing team, forming a tunnel between the two sides. They then attempt to gain possession of the football as it's thrown through the tunnel. It's somewhat analogous to a jump ball in basketball. The scrum meeting is where everyone comes together in order to start things up again, but without the rugby aspect of locking heads and then trying to tackle the competition. But enough about sports. Scrum also has an event called the Sprint Review. This is a collaborative meeting to show what was accomplished during the sprint and get feedback on the work shown to stakeholders. With software, this includes some type of demo, but this isn't a polished Steve Jobs style presentation. The goal is to provide true transparency on what has been done. As people inspect what was accomplished, they provide feedback that can be used to adapt to the way work is done in the next sprint to provide the best return on investment possible. The last event to discuss is the sprint retrospective. This meeting is a chance for the team to reflect on how things have gone and how they can be improved. This event is based on the inspection and adaptation pillars mentioned earlier. For teams following Agile, this event is one of the ways teams follow the principle that says they should reflect on how to become more effective and adjust accordingly. So that is the five events, the Sprint, Sprint Planning, Daily Scrum, Sprint Review, and Sprint Retrospective. Now let's look at the artifacts from Scrum. These are the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. The product backlog is a list of things that the product owner wants or thinks they may want. In software, this usually is an ordered list of features with the things the product owner sees as producing greater return on investment at the top of the list. The product backlog is the source for the sprint backlog, which is the set of items that have been selected for the current sprint. The sprint backlog is populated at sprint planning, and it helps keep the team focused on just what is needed for the current sprint without the added noise of everything in the full product backlog. The sprint backlog provides a great deal of transparency in understanding the progress being made toward the current sprint goal. The last artifact is the increment. The increment is the thing that is actually delivered. For example, it might be a new release of the software with all the new features that were completed in the sprint. This increment should be something that is potentially shippable or deployable. This means it needs to fully meet the definition of done with all the proper testing and cleanup that would be necessary to start getting a return on investment from it. So what does this look like altogether? The simplest way to think of Scrum is as two loops. The outer loop is the two-week iteration with the planning, review, or demo, and retrospective occurring on a cadence of every two weeks. Each iteration is inspected, and the next one is adapted to try to make it just a little bit better. Within this two-week loop is a 24-hour loop that starts with the daily scrum meeting and is also focused on providing transparency so the work done tomorrow is adapted to make improvements based on what we've learned today. So there you have a good high-level overview of scrum. A subsequent video will answer frequently asked questions about Scrum, so look for it if you're interested. Okay, we'll now look at user stories and then user cases. Hi, I'm Mark. I help organizations write software more efficiently. A big part of this is helping teams find ways to organize their work in a way that follows agile values and principles. In this video, we're going to talk about creating user stories. User stories aren't agile in and of themselves, but they can be used to help us follow agile principles. For example, here are three agile principles that we should keep in mind for this video. Working software is the primary measure of progress. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, is essential. If working software is the primary measure of progress, we need to make sure we organize and track our work in a way that supports this goal. 
We need to make sure that our work is organized and chunked into units that represent value to the customer, and we need a way to sort out what is extremely valuable from what is less important. Most teams find that the best way to achieve these things is to visualize their work so it's easy to see what has been done, what is being done, and what is yet to be done. Visualizing the state of various pieces of work can be done in software or even on a wall with sticky notes, but in this video we want to concentrate just on how to represent the unit's work. A good approach is to represent the work through simple stories that describe what the user's world must look like in order to mark a story as complete. Here are some example stories using a typical story template. As a registered user, I want to change my password so I can keep my account secure. As a website visitor, I want to subscribe to the mailing list for a product so I can get product updates through email. As an admin user, I want to disable a user so I can prevent unauthorized logins by past employees. As a mobile app user, I want to save all my data to the cloud so I can access it from another device. There isn't anything magical about this particular format for stories. The examples we've just seen cover who, what, and why. Having a template is a good way to make sure you capture enough information to represent the idea of what the user needs without getting bogged down in all the implementation details. When our development efforts are driven by stories that represent our understanding of user needs, it supports our principles and fosters good development practices. Stories that are written in ways that violate our principles will hinder good development practices. Anything we can do to increase the quality of our stories will make the rest of our development process more efficient. One time, I was working with a team that was just starting to organize their work like this, and we were using a template similar to the one we've just seen. One of the users had missed the initial meeting where we explained what we were trying to do. He was a bit confused and asked why he kept seeing all these short pieces of poetry about software. Evidently, he thought we were writing some strange form of haiku. Good stories start off as fiction. The setting is the world in which the user interacts with the software. The story is written from the user's point of view and talks about things from the perspective of the user. The user perspective is very important because our principles say that we are going to define our progress based on giving the user the ability to do something valuable with the software that they were not able to do before. If we are working on stories that aren't creating business value for the customer, we are doing work that we've explicitly said isn't going to count as progress. So how do we handle all the work we need to do that the user can't see? How do we handle stories about the developer's world? How do we handle stories like this? As a developer, I want a database with all the tables to model the data so I can store information the application needs. This is a bad story because it violates our principles for software development. Notice I said the story is bad, not the idea of having a database to store data. We definitely need a database. But if we create this story, almost all of the application depends on it being done first. We could complete this story and have no functionality we can show our user, nothing they can actually use as working software. But this would violate our principles. Further, the information we need to acquire to complete this story will only be known when we've figured out how we are going to build the other parts of the system. So in effect, a story like this is both a prerequisite for and a dependency of every other story. When you have two things that both depend on the other being done first, you have a recipe for deadlock. If you've ever worked on a story like this, you may have experienced a long period of time where the user is asking how things are going and the development team is saying, well, we have a bunch of setup work to do first before we can start working on the actual application. There is another way. If you write your stories from the user perspective, 
you can build just the parts you need in order to create some value for the user. This likely will mean building some of the database, but only the pieces you need as you need them to complete each story. It may seem counterintuitive for developers to build software from the user's perspective, because such an approach means you may have to rework some of the things you've done in the past as future stories become clear. However, software projects that fail usually do so because they weren't focused on delivering actual usable business value to the user on a regular basis. Building the application the way the user thinks about value minimizes this risk. If you are following the other Agile principles, the cost of some rework is trivial compared to the benefits it provides in delivering business value sooner rather than later. What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. If you think about it, there are two ways to describe what an application is meant to do. You can focus on the features or the requirements of your app where you say the system must do this or the application must achieve that. Or you can focus on the users of your application by answering how does a certain user accomplish a particular goal with our application. By the way, uh, we are not applying this in most of our businesses to software. Some of us have software, but we're applying this to our product. So what is a feature of the wall bed versus what is it from the user's perspective that the wall bed will do? That's a slightly different perspective from the feature of a steel beam to the feature of a roller coaster because of what that beam can do. And, and so it's a, it's a mind twist for all of us a little bit to think of our product line or our service that we're providing from the point of view of the features of the phone to what will this phone do for me as a user? And, and, and that's an instrument or a device. Uh, and and it, it's, it, it's software related, but uh, our instrument or our device may not be software related. Describing your application in a user-focused manner and contrary to the feature-focused manner allows you to write these requirements in everyday language, as non-technical as possible. A typical user of this app should be able to read one of these descriptions and understand it. Now, there is no one required way to write these, but there are two formats commonly used in this phase of the design process. One is called a use case, and the other is a user story. In this video, we're going to talk about both, and in a later video, we are going to expand on how we can design or draw these use cases. So, the most essential parts of a use case are the title that describes the goal we are looking for, the person or actor who wants that goal satisfied, and the scenario or series of steps needed to accomplish the goal. These steps describe a complete encounter between the actor and our system, hence can have multiple possible results, and can even include sections for when things go wrong. Now, the best title for a use case is a short phrase with an active verb, Examples here might be add a new member, send mail, purchase items in cart, create note, and so on. These could all be separate use cases which define distinct goals of our application. Then we have the actor. The reason that we say actor rather than just user is because we often need to identify exactly who is having this interaction. It could be a generic user, but also a customer, member, or administrator, and it even doesn't have to be a human being. It could be another computer system or service interacting with our application. So any external entity that acts on our system is an actor. Now comes the scenario, or the details that will help us achieve this one goal. This could be written as a single paragraph, like the one you see in front of you. This paragraph should be short and easy to understand by any typical user of the application. It's also very common to write the scenario as individual steps, as a numbered list. Now, notice that in both examples we wrote, we described the normal expected flow, or what we call the success scenario. Again, this is not pseudocode. This is not something we take to our code editor and start writing. We are not there yet, and we're not trying to be. Now, depending on the situation, you can add extensions to your success scenario. Steps for alternative flows, like what happens when items are out of stock, or for when things go wrong, like payment problems. 
And if it's more useful, you can add more specific details about the scenario. One common example would be a precondition. What must be true to begin this use case? Here perhaps the precondition would be a customer has added at least one item to the shopping cart. That's the only way this use case makes sense. Okay, after writing the title, actor, scenario, and possibly a precondition, for your use case, you should be fine and ready to go. And 95% of the time, you won't be required to write more than that. However, you may sometimes encounter fully dressed use cases, and these go beyond the usual fields we just discussed, to include multiple placeholders for a trigger and description, preconditions, postconditions, stakeholders, etc. And these often exist as PDF templates or Word document templates that you can fill in. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are also use case diagrams. But forget about the diagram for a moment, because use cases are first and foremost written texts and not diagrams. We will see the use case diagrams in a future video. But as with all diagrams, they are here to support written use cases and not replace them. Let's go ahead now and expand on actors and scenarios. An actor in a use case is anything with behavior who lives outside of our system, outside of our application, but has a goal they want to accomplish within. And these are usually human beings, but not always. Sometimes coming up with the actor is very straightforward, like if you are building a simple one-person application. And sometimes you might need to spend a few minutes brainstorming the main actors of your app or a particular use case. What you can start by doing is separate human and non-human interactions between your app and the outside world. You see, it's quite common that use cases involve multiple actors, and we'll typically refer to them as the primary actors and the secondary or supporting actors. Now, the primary actors aren't necessarily the most important actors in the scenario. They're just the one who initiated this particular use case. So in the example we previously wrote, the primary actor was the customer. Anyone else is a secondary actor. Now, the initiated use case might go through a lot of steps, and some of these steps might fail, and that leads us into talking more about sketching out these steps in the scenario part of our use case. When we describe a use case scenario, we're typically looking at describing a goal that an actor can accomplish in a single encounter, and we're trying to stay focused on the user's goal, on their intention. So, for example, log into application might first sound like a use case. It has an active verb, it typically has multiple steps, multiple conditions, you could forget the password or be required to register, and so on. But, if we emphasize on the user's goal, we realize that their goal with our system is not to log in. The reason they want to log in is to do something. So what is that something in your system? Is it to purchase items? To check their account balance? These are user-focused goals, each with several steps that could be accomplished in one encounter. Logging in might be part of these use cases, part of one of these goals, but it's not a use case on its own. When writing a scenario, you want to focus on the true goal of the user, emphasize on one of the encounters. Now, a simple casual use case can still have multiple scenarios. We've talked about the main success scenario, that's the one you want to focus on. But when necessary, you also need to describe the alternate path or extensions. So, in the case of purchasing items, you might have a couple of options for what happens when something is out of stock. What happens if the customer payment method is rejected? However, here you're not trying to lay out all the possible events, just the typical situations that would occur and what would you want to do with those situations. When you're writing, use active voice. Omit needless words, omit needless details. It's very common to see sentences like The system is provided with the payments information by the customer. But you could just as easily say Customer provides payment information. Active voice, easier to read, short, concise. Notice also that we're describing all this without the words like page, click, button, select, mouse, none of that. There's no click the checkout button. We're focusing on the intention. The user interface will follow the function of our application and what we want to do. Now, once you come up with your first actors and goals, you should ask yourself a few more questions to see if you've missed anything. Like, do we have role-based actors? And if so, who is the administrator of our system? Or who manages the users of our system? What happens if the system fails? Is anyone monitoring our system's activity or storing logs? You will often find that these questions will reveal a couple obvious actors for your application. 
Finally, before ending the video, I want to briefly mention user stories. A user story is simpler and shorter than a use case. It still describes a single small scenario from a user's perspective, focused on their goal rather than on the system. But unlike a use case, which could be extended as we discussed to several pages, a user story is typically written as just one, perhaps two sentences. This forces us to keep them very short, and that's kind of the point here. User stories follow a particular format, and the format looks something like this. As a user or role, I want a particular goal so that I benefit from it in this particular way. An example could be that, as a user, I want to be able to sort the entries by date so that I can find the most recent content focused on one specific goal of one specific user for a particular reason or benefit. User stories focus on intent. What we're doing is expressing one need. We're not detailing alternate paths or exceptions or listing any technical information. They're a very quick, readable summary of what a specific goal is and why the user wants it. When you first hear about them, it can be tempting to regard a user story as just a shorter use case. But that would be a mistake. They are really very different things. A user story is a placeholder for a conversation. It's a reminder that we need to get deeper into the details of something. Whereas a use case can be regarded as a record of a conversation that already happened. It will detail the steps of how a particular goal may or may not be achieved. Use cases are regarded as the more formal, unified process methodology you'd use but if you're working in a scrum environment, which we will discuss in future videos, you should expect to see a focus on user stories. Anyway, however you do it, I assure you that describing your system in simple language and easy to read terms is incredibly useful. So, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care, and I will see you in the next one. All right, I'm going to summarize with a couple of things. Um, an example from a company uh, here in town uh, that most of you know, uh, this is, I don't have it on the screen, so I got it on my phone. You can look at this. This is the revenue chart from a company here in town uh, that is called Lovesack. I don't know if you've heard of Lovesack or not, but they're traded publicly. Uh, they uh, moved their headquarters here to St. George a few years ago. Uh, their sales annual revenue uh, 2018 was in 2019 it went up uh, 37%, I'm sorry, 46%, uh, then 20, up 38%, up 52%, up 37%. So that's incredible growth for a company um, and they're at $0.6 billion in sales right now. 0.6 billion. That's 600 million in sales. That's a good-sized company uh, for St. George, anyway. And they have driven that growth on user stories. Now think about their product. It's a couch that goes in your family room, and it's a module couch that's uncomfortable to sit in. I mean, that's my opinion. But uh, that's just because I don't like to stick with my legs sticking straight out. I like to stick uh, sit other ways. But anyway. Um, there are three user stories that they're talking about. Your, your couch and your family room. There's stuff you want to do with it. One of the things you want to do with it, you're going to spill crap on it, and the dog's going to do, be on it. So you need to be able to you know, pull it wrong side out and put it in the washing machine and clean it. Couches, you can't do that with. Your dad's lazy boy, you're screwed. You know, it's got Scotch Guard treatment that doesn't work. So how, how do you do that? And so Love Sex said that's one user story. Another user story is you want music, you want tunes. So they, they partnered with a stereo company and they, they've got speakers that can be hidden however you want in the couch. So you talk about surround sound, it's you're sitting on it. That's a user story. Our users want their music or they want their movies to have Lucas bass in it and whatever. We want, we want a musical effect. The other thing we want, user story, I want to charge this up, and I want cords. I want to sit it down on the couch and be charging. So they got charging stations built in around the couch, wherever you want them to be. You can, you can configure them. Now, it's expensive to do that, but their stock price is going up. Their revenue is going up based on three user stories 
that their competitors refuse to answer. Now think about that. That is agile scrum underlined three times. They don't write software at all. <laughs> it's all about an expensive couch. And, uh, and they're cool. You know, just because I don't like to sit on them doesn't mean they're not cool. Uh, they are cool. So with that, uh, we're trying to do that kind of thinking. We're trying to borrow from industry that's used this radical way of approaching development uh, and streamlining it in a way that will work for us. So we're done for the day. Uh, I hope you voted. Uh, we will see you on Thursday. Thank you. I had a question for you, Andrew, before you're done typing. Yes. Uh, I'm not, you can finish typing. Oh, you're fine. Man hours to build a wall bed. How many man hours do you have? Uh, wall it depends on the style, All right? So let's go, let's go. Uh, eight. Okay, you type and I'll come back to you in a second. Yeah, I'm a piece of my I'm not done. I will, I'm going to do some more stuff on this and I'll send it to you guys right now, okay? Yeah, cool. You guys have a good night. Thank you, you too. So, I won't tell you if you If you are on eight sick days, mm -hmm. one per year, if you have 50 employees, you lose 3,200 man hours per year. If you can make eight man, if it's eight man hours per wall bed, there's 400 wall beds behind you per year. Yeah, and that's, that's, So you Some are be less. Oh yeah. Okay. We so we have we have jobs that are, are half that time. Okay. So you would double this. Yeah. That's and amazing. even some that can be done by one person in one hour. Okay. So if you want to make up thirty two hundred man hours in a year, if you had three people at half time or four hours per day, it buys you thirty two hundred hours. If you have a pool of three that come in when you need them. Right. You only need them when these people call, them, which may be two a day. It may be I don't know what it is, but you you've people got lie. the data. People you've lie. got the data, so yeah. it's not it's not that insurmountable a problem. No, it's no. it's adding three people that you don't need except to cover the people that are not there. So they have to be trained. They have to be spent money on to get them. But it's a it's a slot a slack of three extra players. Right. Three guys sitting on your bench. You don't call them into play until you need them. You got a guy gets his knee blown out, you need a guy, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I think that it's... Can I take that? Yeah, you can. Yeah. That Absolutely. could be relocating somebody like Brandon who knows how to build. Uh, maybe CJ, you know, for half a day, you know, or something like that. Sure. Maybe well, maybe well right now, right now, it's me and Larry. I went, I went from assembly to finishing to final prep. Four different rotations today. And that's an expensive way to do that. <laughs> it is an expensive way to do that. It is an expensive way to yeah. do that. But and, you get it done, but you'd right. rather do it a different way. Well, and, and my time is spent 
with my head down. I'm not yeah. watching what's happening. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. And that's also expensive. Yeah, you bet it is. Uh, yeah. But I think you got a grasp on it right there. I think it's. I think you can solve. Oh, that's that. fantastic. That's yeah. uh, when you put dollars and cents like that. Uh, it makes it easier to number one. It makes it easier to sell. Yeah, it's right. Not no, it's not. I can go in and say, hey, let's let's do this thing while we figure out this other thing. And I'll be like, hey, that's fantastic. Let's do that right now. Why are we waiting? Yeah. Um, and it will be easier to find people to fill those spots. Because I can say, okay, we need to fill these spots. Well, let me go to a temp agency. Because yeah. right now we don't want to go to a temp agency. Good because you're paying. It's too expensive. Well, well yeah, you're. you're <laughs> yeah, how expensive is it in this 600 wall beds? Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, right now every every blank spot that we have to schedule in our in our daily cycle is uh, four thousand. That's super. Important. It's extremely expensive to have a blank cycle in our, yep. in our life. Well, you never make it up. It's a, gone. a lost cycle of an injection molder never gets that part back. You nope. never recover your cash for that. It's gone, gone. gone forever. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. we have we have blank cycles two or three times a day. And when you got guys on your management team that are aware of that, like you are. I found this on the web. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> Google's listening. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It is, it's extremely expensive. Yeah. And, and we know that. I know that. Larry we'll double check that. my numbers and make sure I didn't make a math mistake. I will, yeah, yeah, I will, for sure. Yeah. So, but I, I appreciate that. That's gonna go, uh, that's gonna go a long way. It's gonna help, help me, like, hey, let me get three guys, let me get nine guys. somebody that's on call that knows, hey, I'm going to call you at 10 a.m. I need you here by 11. You'll hear from 11 to 4. Yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 there's hurdles to overcome. It's yeah. Like, you know, you it, got, it would be issues. And it is a part-time situation. It is a, you're on call, and it may cost us a little more to have that individual on call. Depends on how you define on call. You know, if, if, if you say, you're pro we're probably going to have... We're going to have 20 hours work for you this week. Not sure what day it is, but... Just you know, be ready. Be ready. And that means, you know, don't be drunk at 10 o'clock in the morning. Right. You know, stuff like well, that. Well, you know, and we can make it We could make it worth their while. Because you're going to be on call during those 20 hours that you're here on the shop, we'll pay right. you $18, $20 an hour, yeah. whatever that is, to yeah. make it worth their time. Yeah. To make sure that they, you, you know, know... there's people that want a job like that. They go, oh, yeah. They're going to school, they're doing something else in their life, or they're just... That's all they want to work. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I've got I've got one guy that used to work for us that's really good in the finishing department, and I hit him up uh, a couple months ago when we were doing the, uh, uh, the performance leadership. I was calling old employees. Mm -hmm. Hey, you want a job? Mm -hmm. We'll get you back on. Uh, and he said, you know what? I'm still going to call it during the day. Your schedule doesn't really work with my classes, but it would be great to call and say, hey, we've got this spot. It's an on-call spot. When are you uh, available? When if we can have you available. Yeah. You so, know what I mean? Yeah. He would probably jump at it. And the cool thing is you don't need that many people. I don't. Yeah. I don't. It, would, it would be it would be fantastic to have that. Your reserve corps. Your, yeah. Your team. Your, you know, yep. your SWAT team. You call them whatever. <laughs> right. I mean, SWAT teams don't work full-time days. They, they get called when there's an emergency. Yep. And they're elite. You know, yeah. it's, it's, you know. They, and they get paid for their skills. Sure. Yeah, as you should. Yeah. 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 Um, that's great. Good man. Thinking outside the box right there. Yeah, I is. appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> Let me shut this down so we're not recording.